maybe we should say that this is a this is a set of equations that govern in the field of fluid dynamics. Yes, uh, trying to understand how fluid behaves, and it's actually turns out to be a really complicated. You know, fluid is yeah extremely complicated thing to try to model. Yeah, so it has practical importance. So this clay price problem concerns what's called the incompressible Navier-Stokes, which governs things like water. There's something called the compressible Navier-Stokes, which governs things like air. And that's particularly important for weather prediction. Weather prediction, it does a lot of computational fluid dynamics. A lot of it is actually just trying to solve the Navier-Stokes equations as, as best they can. Um, also gathering a lot of data so that they can get they can in initialize the equation. There's a lot of moving parts. So it's a very important problem practically. Why is it difficult to prove general things about the set of equations like it not, not blowing up? The short answer is Maxwell's demon. Um, so Axel's demon is a concept in thermodynamics. Like if you have a box with two gases in it, uh, oxygen and nitrogen, uh, and maybe you start with all the oxygen on one side and nitrogen on the other side, but there's no barrier between them, right? Then they will mix, um, and they should stay mixed, right? There's, there's no reason why they should unmix. But in principle, because of all the collisions between them, there could be some sort of weird conspiracy like, that, um, like maybe there's a microscopic demon called Maxwell's demon that will, um, every time an oxygen and nitrogen atom collide, they will bounce off in such a way that the oxygen sort of drifts onto one side and then nitrogen goes to the other. And uh, you could have an extremely improbable configuration emerge, uh, which we never see. Um, and and we, we, statistically, it's extremely unlikely. But mathematically, it's possible that this can happen and we can't rule it out. Um, and this is a situation that shows up a lot in mathematics. Um, a basic example is the digits of pi, 3.14159 and so forth. The digits look like they have no pattern, and we believe they have no pattern. On the long term, you should see as many ones and twos and threes as fours and fives and sixes. Uh, there should be no preference in the digits of pi to favor, let's say, seven over eight. Um, but maybe there's some demon in the digits of pi that, that like every time you compute more and more digits, it sort of biases one digit to another. Um, and this is a conspiracy that should not happen. There's no reason it, it should happen, but um, there's, there's, there's no way to prove it uh, with our current technology. Okay, so getting back to Navier-Stokes, a fluid has a certain amount of energy. And because the fluid is in motion, the energy gets transported around. And uh, water is also viscous. So if the energy is spread out over many different locations, the natural viscosity of the fluid will just damp out the energy and it will, it will, it will go to zero. Um, and this is what happens um, in um, uh, when we actually experiment with water. Like it, you splash around, there's, there's some turbulence and, and waves and so forth, but eventually it, it settles down and, and, and the, the lower the amplitude, the, the smaller the velocity, the, the more calm it gets. Um, but potentially there is some sort of demon that keeps pushing the uh, the energy of the fluid into a smaller and smaller scale. And it will move faster and faster, and at faster speeds, the effective viscosity is relatively less. And so it could happen that, that it, it creates a, some sort of um, um, what's called a self-similar blob scenario, where you know um, the energy of the fluid starts off at some um, large scale, and then it all sort of um, transfers its energy into a smaller um, region of, of, of the fluid, which then at a much faster rate um, moves into, into um, an even smaller uh, region and so forth. Um, and and each time it does this, uh, it takes maybe half as, as, as long as, as, as the previous one. And then yeah, you, you, could, you could actually uh, converge to, to all the energy um, concentrating in one point in a, a finite amount of time. Um, and that, that, that's, uh, that scenario is called finite time blow up. Um, so in practice, this doesn't happen. Um, so water is what's called turbulent. Um, so it is true that um, if you have a big eddy of water, it will tend to break up into smaller eddies, but it won't transfer all this, the energy from one big eddy into one smaller eddy. It will transfer into maybe three or four. And then those ones split up into maybe three or four small eddies of their own. And so the energy gets dispersed to the point where the viscosity can, can then keep everything under control. Um, but if it can somehow um, concentrate um, all the energy, keep it all together, uh, and do it fast enough that the viscous effects don't have enough time to calm everything down, then this blob can occur. So there are papers who had claimed that, oh, you just need to take into account conservation of energy and just carefully use the viscosity and you can keep everything under control for not just the Navier-Stokes, but for many, many types of equations like this. And so in the past, there have been many attempts to try to obtain what's called global regularity for Navier-Stokes, which is the opposite of finite time blower, that velocity stays smooth. And it all failed. There was always some sign error or some subtle mistake, and, and it, it couldn't be salvaged. Um, so what I was interested in doing was trying to explain why we were not able to disprove um, finite time blower. 
I couldn't do it for the actual equations of fluids, which were too complicated. But if I could average the equations of motion of an average, so basically, if if um, if I could turn off certain types of of ways in which water interacts and only keep the ones that I want. Um, so in particular, um, if um, if there's a fluid and it could transfer its energy from a large eddy into this small eddy or this other small eddy, I would turn off the energy channel that would transfer energy to this this one and and direct it only into um, this smaller eddy while still preserving the law of conservation of energy. So you're trying to make it blow up. Yeah. Yeah. So I I, I basically engineer um, a blow up by changing the laws of physics, which is one thing that mathematicians are allowed to do. We can change the equation. How does that help you get closer to the proof of something? Right. So it provides what's called an ob obstruction in mathematics. Um, so so what I did was that uh, basically, if I turned off the um, certain parts of the equation, so that, which usually when you turn off certain interactions, make it less nonlinear, it makes it more regular and less likely to blow up. But I found that by turning off a very well designed set of 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 of, of, of interactions, I could force all the energy to, to blow up, you know, in finite time. So what that means is that if you wanted to prove um, global regularity for Navier-Stokes um, for the actual equation, you had you must use some feature of the true equation, which which my artificial equation um, does not satisfy. So it it rules out certain um, certain approaches. So um, the thing about math is, is it's not just about finding you know, you know taking a technique that is going to work and applying it, but you you need to not take the techniques that don't work. Um, and for the problems that are really hard, often there are dozens of ways that m you might think might apply. To solve the problem, but uh, it's only after a lot of experience that you realize there's no way that these methods are going to work. So having these counterexamples for nearby problems um, kind of rules out. Um, uh, it, it saves you a lot of time because you, you you're not wasting um, energy on on things that you now know cannot possibly ever work.